Hey everybody, welcome to another episode, oops, I always forget to put me big, um, welcome to another episode of Design Recharge, I'm Diane Gibbs, I'm your host, and I'm joined by Roz Stendhal today, and I am really excited to share her with y'all, um, I come from a background of, I'm a crafter at heart, and I found Roz through some of my crafting stuff, but she is an amazing designer, illustrator, um, when you see your work, you're going to be blown away, and hopefully it'll inspire you to do some more sketching and some more um, interesting topics. And maybe April, you'll commit to her challenge to you is do a fake journal in April. So, Roz, give us a little bit of your background, and thanks again so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to uh, everyone, and uh, especially as relates to uh, International Fake Journal Month, which is April. Um, my background is uh, uh, basically the brief version is um, I went to school and got an MA in English and went into publishing and uh, was in the editorial and production end of publishing, worked for Publishing House, where I had a couple bad experiences with designers. Uh, throwing attitude <laughs> and overcharging and so I went to my boss and said hey um, I want to do all my own designs and he said fine but you still got to do all your other work and I said fine and then about uh, six months after that maybe eight months I left to start my own company and he became my biggest client for a number of years until that company sort of faded out of existence because you know everybody's always being bought up and split apart and so on um, but anyway, so that's that's how I went from editorial into design, and um, uh, what was else was. Did, but you always loved um, sketching, so sketching oh, was yeah. a huge part. So talk about like a little, give us a little bit of your background on that. Yeah. Um, well, when I was very little, my mother, um, she liked uh, my brother, who's a year and a half older than myself. She liked us to be uh, self-sufficient and pretty much out of her hair. And so um, she was always trying to find activities. And so when I was very, very young, she gave me a book to scribble in. And I sort of took that as, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, th command for life. is Just go out, observe, write down. And I've basically been doing it since. So sometimes it's more uh, verbal and there's a lot of writing. Sometimes uh, it's more visual. But it's always been a mix. And um, it's just something that I've always done. Oh, and then uh, later on, uh, which sort of enhanced this more. I mean, my parents would take us to various places around the world because my father traveled for business, and uh, we would oftentimes be left in places where, you know, there's a lot of different stuff to our eyes because, we, you know, we were in a new culture and so on. So I had a lot to record and think about. Uh, but in school, when I was in, um, uh, which would have been uh, seventh grade, uh, which is first form in Australia, uh, I was a little bit disruptive in art class, and so my teacher decided that, you know, here's a pad of paper and some charcoal. Now go into the park, which was outside the school grounds, and draw birds. And it was the best thing that could have happened to me because I already loved birds, but now I was given permission to go out there and draw them. And uh, I've basically been out sitting in a field ever since <laughs> with a sketchbook. So it's all her fault. <laughs> well, that's good. I don't yeah. know if that would happen today. You probably she would no, probably get of sued. No, think liability issues. She sent this this girl out into a park, a public park. I mean, come on. But I think everybody who has ever known me has known that I was never at risk for anything because I was just too lippy. So I, I think that's it. All right. So you have been creating these journals, really, and I know you've yeah. amassed three and a lot. Half. Three and a half. Well, we want to be exact. Um, you but, asked how many I had. We actually uh, we, we couldn't count each individual one up because numbers of them are boxed. But we did kind of a rough estimate for the years that they're boxed and so on. And we worked out there's over 1,100 of them. Wow. Yeah. So um, and, and Mike is here, and she uh, I had interviewed, and she makes a lot. She's very prolific, like you, and. Um, she actually cut hers up when they were moving. She's a military family, and so she didn't want to have to box up all those. So I know that you really haven't moved. You went, um, you moved to Minnesota, right? In grad well, I school? haven't moved as an adult, but as a child, we moved every right. couple of years. You know, right. We moved constantly. And in fact, that led to, uh, you know, I would have more journals, but some of them were lost in one of the Trans-Pacific, uh, you know, moves, and uh, some were lost when 
Um, this is a really sad story. I don't know if you want me to tell it on the air. Sure. People will cry. But um, we went. My mother said, um, "You need to come and get all of your stuff. Uh, your dad and I are moving from St. Louis. We're retiring, so we want all of your stuff." And this was nice, you know. Just come and get it. We don't want to move it again. And so we drove down there, and we had a U-Haul, and we spent the whole day going through my stuff in the boxes and packed it all up, went upstairs to have some wonderful potato soup, which my mother makes, which is just delicious, had a nice evening, um, and then uh, sometime later that evening, my dad and uh, my husband loaded the stuff into the truck. We drove home the next day. We were so exhausted. Uh, we packed all the stuff up in the attic, and I didn't look at it again for six months. And when I did go up and look at it, I found that we had a lovely crate of bar glasses. We had taken the wrong crate, we'd taken the crate that they were going to give to the Goodwill because they were getting rid of all their bar glasses. And, and so all of my stuff went to the Goodwill and since it's six months later there's no way you know to retrieve any of that. And um, I was pretty torn up for a while because it was mostly some of my childhood stuff and some of my mid-teen year stuff. And because once I was in, in college, of course, all my journals stayed with me. And um, but um, I think you know it would be nice to think maybe someone found them and cut them up for collage material. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. But that is sad. That's sad that you lost them. But I think it's hard. In eleven hundred, eleven eleven hundred. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of um, yeah. yeah. And. You're making more than one a year, right? right? Um, I probably now, um, for the last 20 years or so, have between uh, 18 to 28 journals a year that I go through. That's awesome. Very inspiring, for sure. And I think a lot of people have been inspired by you. You got a lot of yay for sketchbook school, and a lot of people are coming in from all over, so I'm really, really excited to have you, Roz. So tell us a little bit, for people maybe who haven't seen, you've been creating these visual journals, what are some of your favorite things to draw? Uh, favorite things are basically dogs, birds, rocks, and people. All right, so we're going to go through some of these images while you talk about them, if that's okay. So yeah, I, I basically see myself as a portrait artist, and so that's those are the things I like to draw portraits of. Right. And so the first thing here we're looking at, that's, um, that's Dottie. Uh, she's my second Alaska Malamute. I had two that o they overlap for a while. Um, lovely, lovely dog. Very, very pretty. And um, partly out of grief because I'd lost Emma, uh, but also because my last daily project for the year had ended. Um, I was looking around for another daily project and, and just happened to look down at the rug where she was sleeping and thought, well, I'll draw her every day. And I did that for the first year, which was the length of the project, and then decided that I really enjoyed it so much I would keep going. And um, I drew her until she died. And um, that was about uh, four and a half, not quite five years. And so I have 43 volumes of drawings just of her. A uh, lot that's. I'm sorry. That's awesome. No, that's awesome. And I used different materials uh, over, over the years that I was doing it. Sometimes it was pencil. Uh, sometimes I started to change up the books and the paper I was using. And uh, I got into some watercolor and some other things like that. But just whatever seemed right. But right. she was a lovely, lovely model. And you, you said, I guess as a puppy, she had she didn't stay still for very long. So you ended up drawing her sleeping yeah. most of the time. But I think, it, you know, it was you were challenge yourself to use different mediums, use different tools, and then and and to try to get her in some action. Some of them have some action shots in there. Sometimes, you know, with a trained dog, and she was trained for search and rescue, and, and she had the basic, you know, obedience stuff, um, you have ways with clicker training and, and food treats and stuff to get them to hold a pose or return to a pose. So the ones where she's staring right at me, I'm, I'm usually drawing with one hand and holding a biscuit with the other. <laughs> or maybe maybe Dick is eating something and she's so intent because she knows that she's going to get the leftovers that she's staring at him for a couple of minutes and I tell him to eat slowly. Yeah, but right, I, I, tell, right. I, I tell all my students that it's if if you have a companion animal um, when they're sleeping is one of the best times to take advantage of of learning their form and and sort of exploring that because uh, you know they're not moving around. And working 3D is so much better than, you know, working from a picture. Right. So what kind of tips would you give for a new 
this wasn't our question, but somebody asked it over in the chat. What kind of um, what tips would you give for somebody, an adult, uh, that's just learning how to draw? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, it, you know, it, I guess I would tell them to draw what they, that's so broad. Uh, you know, I would say draw what you love. So if you, if you really love animals and you happen to live with one, uh, do like we, we've just been discussing and do that every day. If you um, like flowers, uh, buy yourself some some um, uh, flowers once a week and uh, set them up and do a still life. Uh, and I think that if you're just learning, you're going to need a little bit of instruction because you're going to need to know some basic things like how to do a contour and uh, uh, how to work with a pencil or whatever. So I guess there's a couple of of uh, you know books maybe um, one of my art heroes is is Kathy Johnson and she's written uh, wonderful books about uh, art and um, uh, she has a book that's the Sierra Club book of drawing and I think it's out of print but you can find used copies and it's an excellent excellent book so I would recommend that for people uh, Betty Edwards drawing on the right side of the mind is an excellent book for learning how to draw and so get that and sort of work your way through and then as you develop a little bit of skill maybe seek out uh, someone who draws or approaches media the way you like it and take a class from them um, but basically it's do something every day even if it's only for five minutes uh, I was already a professional illustrator when I started the Daily Dots but I know that just sometimes at five minutes a day drawing from something that was live really improved by the time the project ended my drawing skill had changed dramatically and um, Micah asked if you always draw straight from life or if you use pictures also I prefer to draw from life and I encourage my students to uh, sometimes it's not possible sometimes clients actually uh, send me photos and say you know we want a product illustration of, of this whatever right. this happens to be or um, I did a, a series of drawings once of uh, dead scientists uh, where obviously <laughs> I couldn't draw and, and so what they did is they purchased the uh, rights to use various photographs of these people uh, and then I had to draw from those um, and in yeah. one case I even had to draw from the guy's statue on his uh, monument in the graveyard um, but you know you, you do what you have to do um, for right. me, uh, sometimes I can't get to life drawing um, uh, something happens and whatever but I need to draw and so then uh, sometimes I'll turn the television on and just do some sketches while the television is going. I do a lot of that. Um, I, I think the basic thing is you have to draw. And then right. the second basic thing is, is really learn to draw from things sitting in front of you. So if it's your pepper that you're about to eat for lunch, because I like to have a red pepper stir fried and stuff, you know, draw that before you sketch it. And, uh, you know, set up still lives with fruit and vegetables or little tools. I draw a lot of shoes because shoes are always around. There's always something that you can draw that's from life, and that'll be better than drawing from a photograph. Right. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to keep going to some okay. more dogs. Okay. Um, so Mike also dogs. has a question. Pardon? A lot yeah. of dogs. Yes, lots of dogs. So oh. do you also have a French bulldog, or is that no, from... No, this is Sophia Grace, and this is weird. I, I saw uh, French bulldogs on some show or at a dog show and I just they're just too cute because after you know 20 years with dogs that were totally covered in fur and my dogs were athletes they really worked hard they were solid muscle but you couldn't see the muscle because there's all this fur and when I saw one of these guys because they're muscly they're you know just yeah you know, and um, and so anyway I asked a friend uh, if she would ask at her vet uh, if anybody had one of these and we hit the mother load, you know, the French Bulldog Club, whatever. But, but the main thing was the receptionist's daughter or granddaughter, I guess this is her grand dog. And so mm. a, a woman, bless her heart, wrote to me and said, I hear from my vet that you want to, you know, draw. She invited me into her home. Uh, you know, she didn't know who I was. Just wonderful. And this dog is absolutely she's more fawn color than than I drew her here but I've drawn numerous drawings of her I just absolutely love her and um, I, I hope to go back and I've been a couple times I didn't get to go last year um, to uh, see her much but um, I hope to get back she's just adorable is so, this another one of her yes yes 
Yeah, and that's more her real color, and, and that's actually exactly how she looks. She is just adorable. <laughs> so yeah. you got some other ones, too. So do you do the same thing? You just go to the vet and... Well, no, this is a friend's dog. Um, this woman had us over to actually draw her chickens, which, of course, I was mad about. And this is Carmen. And uh, I grew up with uh, dachshunds. My, my folks, when we were in the Philippines, we had a dachshund uh, named Libby. Uh, my dad worked for Libby, you know, the food company. And, um, and then when we were in Elkhart, Indiana, we had uh, another one. But they were short hairs. And, and I just saw Carmen. I had to paint a picture of her as a thank you for this woman who invited us to see um, the chickens. And I have chickens, Roz, so I'm into chickens. Too. You have to, oh my gosh, we have to talk. Okay. <laughs> so, so then this is just a dog park dog. Oh, cool. So these are pretty quick. And then you're coloring them at home, or are you bringing no, your media I'm with you? Them, sometimes I'm coloring them right there, too. Um, I did the outline uh, there, and yeah, this was all done, yeah, just right then. Um, sometimes I've actually had, I've also got a thing for Boston's, and that happened because before they tore the Metrodome down, uh, they used to, in the winter, because it's really cold here, they used to uh, turn one of the concourses into a dog park, indoor dog park. And so I used to go there and sit, and I actually, um, and the dogs would walk back and forth in the curve, and uh, a little Boston Terrier came running one day, and I'm sitting there sketching, and she jumped right in my lap, like, you're my person. <laughs> and I was like, how can you not love that? And um, so I was hooked on Boston's also. Oh, that's great. Um, and that's you've got some more. Yeah, that's a neighborhood dog, just a little chihuahua. And, and that's I love... Oh, go ahead. Um, that's actually one that I did a number of sketches from, and then from those sketches, I did a more finished drawing in a really big journal. That's like 9 by 12. Oh, gotcha. And then I love your use of color. And, you know, people over in the chatter, they would love for you to write a book, so you've been asked. Yeah, there's a story about that, but that's another show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, that, that's, a, that's a neighborhood dog. And the coloring is just great. Like, you're using some of the things that, you know, it's just fabulous color. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I have a blog post uh, that I did about the elephant in the room, which talks about, you know, if you don't understand color theory, you know, what's up with that and why don't you? Um, but um, so I encourage people to go uh, and Google that on my blog and, and read about it. I teach color theory, and it's really important for me that people think about it. I don't like to use black paint. And so in this particular dog, which is a black dog, he's a Belgian uh, sheepdog, I believe, is, is um, the breed, if I've got it uh, correct. Um, and he's a purebred dog. Um, if, um, if it's a black dog, and I did this with my dogs too, I use blues and mixes of blues with the complement of orange or, or red, whichever the one that is closest to complement it, and, uh, and make dark uh, neutrals in that fashion. And I think it enhances things. Oh, Makes definitely. It oh, for sure. And that tiny little pop of like orange or red in his ear is just yep. awesome. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, that's just a dog park dog. Um, that one I did paint when I got home. That's a dog park dog. You know, I think you know, that's an imaginary dog. I was I, I, I had been doing for the first five years that they did this, uh, oh, my favorite uh, supply store, Wet Paint, does this charity thing where they get a bunch of artists, we sit outside under an awning, and we everybody brings their animals and we draw them for free. They can donate for the charity, but... Right. You know. And so I was practicing, and I practiced so many dogs that day, and then I just took this vertical piece of paper and thought, well, you know, how do I feel about this? And this is how I felt about that. Um, so this is sort of like a self-portrait. This I tell people, my bird pictures and my dog pictures often have an element of self-portraiture in them. So um, Andrea wants to know, what is your favorite book on color theory, if you have just one? Oh, uh, I would say there are two books by... Um, uh, Stephen Quiller, Q-U-I-L-L-E-R, and he spells Stephen with a P-H. And uh, I think what he does with color is just brilliant. And uh, I think one is Color Choices and, and one is just called Color. Uh, either one is, is great, and both of them have a wonderful color wheel that really shows the whole dynamic of neutralized colors. And I, I really recommend his stuff. I think it's great. 
And Hazel posted your blog post about the elephant in the room. So thank you so much, Hazel, for posting. Way to go, post. Hazel. <laughs> no, she's on it. So then we have some birds because birds are a favorite. I guess you are always a favorite. Um, and then yeah. in seventh grade, you just had that permission to go out and draw that, them. That's right. And then it, we went from there to my mother would get up on Saturday mornings and she would take me out into the wilderness and drop me off at 4 o'clock. <laughs> and and I just sit there and draw, which was really cool in Australia because um, they have more hens and all these birds. I mean, Melbourne is like it's not it's kind of like California temperature, and so it's like not tropical, but there but there are a lot of tropical plants that grow there, and and so the bird culture there is is phenomenal. It would not be unusual for me to walk out. Of the um, uh, out on the patio, we had a small patio off the dining room, and um, uh, see sparrows there, uh, along with galahs and other kinds of birds that are you know more exotic that I would never see you know like in this country. Um, finches are a big thing for me because um, Dick's folks uh, recently, well a couple of years ago, had to move into uh, elder care. And uh, there's been a series of illnesses and hospitalizations, and it seems to me that everywhere elderly people are taken care of, there's always an aviary. And so um, it's, you know, a lot of extra time where you can just go when the doctor, uh, you're waiting for the doctor is something you can go and, and, uh, and sketch. So I have a lot of pictures of my in-laws sleeping and, <laughs> and birds. Sleeping in-laws and birds. <laughs> so uh, I have a question just about this blue um, square that's, that's in this. You have... That's a, that's a Pescia, P-E-S-C-I-A, Magnani, it's Magnani Pescia, and Magnani's the paper company, and uh, it comes in three colors, a cream, a buff, and this light robin's egg blue, which is absolutely, as far as I'm concerned, the prettiest blue paper on the planet, and I frequently use it to make journals. Uh, it's too soft to make case-bound journals because the paper at the joins, uh, the signature joins will pull apart um, because it's just too soft, but you can make sewing on the spine journals with it, and it's just fabulous for that. Oh, it's awesome. It's it's just nice, The just that extra stuff, and we kind of get into that later. We talk about the, the backgrounds and how you uh, add color and things I like that. I think everybody should use this paper. I mean, look at that. You know, I mean, it's just a lovely, lovely, you can't, that blue color is just so sensational. So do you have, because you really use a ton of different kinds of tools, this next image is... Um, oh, this is funny. Can I tell you something about this? Um, please. Um, parallel pens are things that calligraphers use, and mm -hmm. I went down to teach a, um, a calligraphy, uh, at a calligraphy convention, they had me come down and do a week-long color theory course. And the ladies, it was all ladies, uh, they were just all wonderful, and we had a, a really great time. They put up with my, you know, loading them full of information, and um, they had various tools, and I'm looking at all their tools and so on. And I had purchased parallel pens before when they came out, or at least came to my consciousness, uh, but had never really done anything with them. And so I saw them all using them for their calligraphy and stuff, so when I got back, I thought, you know, I'm going to get those pens out again, and I'm going to play around with them. And so rather than do calligraphy, which I don't do, I drew with the parallel pen. And, and, and it's not an easy thing to do because it's a flat nib that is made to be drawn only in one direction and, you know, make letters. And so I really was cutting the hell out of the paper, but I had so much fun. And... I'm all about the fun factor, so so I think if it, if it could, and then it was water soluble ink, so I just went in with a Niji water brush and uh, splashed some shadow on that. It's it's a lot of fun. It's it's a beautiful. So how big is something like that? How big are you working? This one is small. Um, this one is probably um, nine by seven. I think this one is. Okay. Yeah. And then all kinds of different. Um, medium, but you do have some favorites. Yes, I do. Um, I like watercolor and pen and ink, and I love gouache. And this guy's gouache. Um, you can see the opacity. Gouache is op opaque watercolor, um, and um, I, uh, I, 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 I really have to stress. I like to use Schmenke uh, uh, gouache or M. Graham gouache because they for me, work the best. They have the highest pigment load. They don't have opacifiers in them, so you don't get 
weird color mixes when you mix things together. And um, so you 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 know people look at the tubes and they get like sticker shock. The paint goes a long way, and it's worth it. So you know you you get what you pay for, and you really if you want to have the most fun, this is I think uh, the way to go. So Andrea asked a question about are you talking about pilot? Pin parallel pins, or is it like a nib you stick in and? No, it's it's a pilot. She's exactly right. Okay. That's what she's at. Yeah, they come in various nib widths, and I just have some really wide ones, and I just would, you know, sometimes, you know, go sideways and make a thin line, and then go up and down like you're supposed to do and make the thick line, and I right. just keep whipping around. And at one point, I was making so much noise because it it's it's really rough on the paper. Then my husband came into the room. He wanted to know, what the hell are you doing? You know, because it sounded <laughs> like I was cutting stuff up. But anyway. So uh, more birds. You have a affinity for birds for sure. I love to go to the zoo. I, I just, I spend, uh, you know, I try and get there at least once a week. And wow. um, these are the penguins they have at the Como Zoo, which is only 12 minutes away from me. So how perfect is that? And um, puffins and, and penguins, I just absolutely adore them. There's something about their little bodies and the way they're fluffy but solid and muscular. Right. And the component parts. I just love it. And the fact that they're dinosaurs. I mean, how cool is Look at that. Dinosaurs. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Those are dinosaurs. And, and these are quick like, sketches. You're these, not... Yeah, these are all done on site while they're all moving around, and I guess they were pretty active this day because the guy at the top seems to be moving around quite a lot. So, what do you? So, for people who are are just starting yeah. or starting to draw from life, that can be really kind of intimidating. But sometimes it's just get a few of those lines down and keep going, and just turn the page. Don't get caught up in it not looking perfect, right? Well, that's the whole thing. Um, you know. Um, if you're if you're going to learn to draw live animals, you have to learn to draw quickly because live animals, unless you've got them clicker trained, are not going to sit still for you. And so, the more you draw quickly, the more stuff goes into your brain. The more you sort of see the sense and the angles, you develop a vocabulary for it. So, so actually, you shouldn't even be upset about things looking messy. You should embrace the fact that things look messy because this means you're making progress. So, I look at this, and this was done in uh, 2008, and you know, I can see things that I wouldn't do today, and it's you know, and I've been drawing birds my whole life up to this point, and I see things that I wouldn't do. Um, but over on the left hand of this, you can see at the top and in the middle, you can see two points where I started to draw a puffin butt, and then I tried to draw a puffin that was turning its head. And right. I can still see in that whole angle, I could draw a whole bird from that because I got that gesture of that angle down. Right. So that's not throwaway. All of this stuff that people look at and say, well, that's not a finished drawing, that's baloney. That, that's how you get to a finished drawing. And then the other stuff is how you learn and get this vocabulary and learn the proportion. So this is exactly what you want to do. And the more you do it, the better you do it. I, I, I sort of view my whole life is training for the state fair. So, you know, I, you, you throw yourself into realistic situations where animals are, whether it's at a friend's house where chickens are running around or uh, a dog sleeping in your house or, or something, you practice all year long so that you can hit the ground running at the state fair. Because that's what right. it's all about for me. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's 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 a shallow goal, but that's what no, I'm that's I think that's great. I love the state fair too. So some of these look like they've taken a lot more time, though, Roz. Yeah. They're not. Um, actually, it's hanging on the wall up here. It's um, uh, probably 16 by 20 inches, and it's on um, a canvas. I think it's canvas. Might be might be clayboard, and it's gouache. But it's been, we'll talk about backgrounds, but it's had a lot of stuff thrown at it before I painted on top of it. And um, and it's uh, gouache, um, uh, and obviously I've spent a lot of time with that bill. And that bill is not black paint. The bill is all uh, mixtures of blue and um, uh, my favorite blue, which is PB60, which is in Dantheran blue, uh, which is a complement for um, uh, burnt sienna or some of the other oranges. And it makes a perfect dark neutral. I have a little color theory there. <laughs> yeah, that's I just awesome. thought I'd get that in. Um, yeah. So another gouache piece? Uh, no, actually, this is uh, Stabilo Tone, which is something that isn't made anymore. It's very right. similar to uh, Neocolor uh, twos uh, from Caron Dash. But um, this is over a pre-painted uh, acrylic ink background, and um, or I guess that's fluid acrylic on that one. 
and uh, and you can get it sort of opaque, but you can see uh, there's um, uh, drippiness going and coming through the orange, and uh, it's just kind of fun. And this, you, you, you I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, you, 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 I paint it on, and then I wet the first layer, and then when I start painting the second layer, then I just start pushing it around with my thumb. Gotcha. And so yeah, this is all dirty. Yeah, you get to totally filthy. Um, and this is done um, in the studio from a bunch of, of AV, you know, um, aviary sketches, and as so, so Andrea asks, but drawing slowly is just as important for learning, I guess. And I really think probably a lot of it has to do with how you're looking. And Micah says that later. It's really about teaching yourself how to see. Yeah. What do you think? You don't think so? Yeah, I don't think drawing slowly is a, uh, you know, if you want to draw slowly, that's great. But my life would be over. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I, I can't cope with that. Um, you know, I, I did a drawing actually in my journal once of a chipmunk, and then I wrote next to it, some of us just live faster than others. <laughs> and that's sort of, you know, my metabolism is like this. So for me, I can't conceive of drawing slowly. What I will say is that you have to look closely. And looking closely, whether it's fast or slow, that's what gets you the drawing improvement. So it's looking closely that matters at whatever speed you're doing it. And looking closely to see how this angle curves into that angle and how this space is, you know, X amount of this, you know, uh, proportion of that and so on. And it's, it's looking closely at those things which I think makes the difference. And however fast or slow you do that, if you're really looking, because one of the things is we've all seen pictures that people do and we think, eh, you know, it's sort of there, but it's not really there. And, and it's because they didn't, after a while, it's like they faded off and then they just sort of did a little line at the bottom that's supposed to be the foot. Now, if you're Picasso, you can do a little line and it is a foot, okay? But for the rest of us, we have to observe that before we can just start scribbling around. Right. Yeah. Well, and I and I think it, it is a lot about how teaching yourself to look at something yeah. and see like like the black dog or the black bill. It's it's not really all black. You have to see those other colors that are within it, and I think that is really helpful. But it's about analyzing it and taking the time to really look. So yes, I agree. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna keep jumping in. Um, and somebody says if they Kate says if they draw too slow, they get stuck. So I think. It can be yeah. one of those perfectionist things, so you just got to flip the page and keep going. Yeah, and, and I so think you, all, you do get stuck because okay. your brain starts thinking and thinking. Instead, you just have to get out of your own way. <clears throat> Excuse me. A rock. So you also I, like to, to draw rocks. And I do. these look so real. <laughs> yeah, actually, the greatest compliment on my rocks I've ever had is a geologist came to one of my shows, and he walked up to me, and he said, how did you shave the rocks so thin? <laughs> oh, I, that's... Well, sir, uh, here's the name of my eye doctor. He's really good. Um, those, are, those are paintings. These are probably, um, uh, they're, they're bigger than the actual rock. The rocks were probably that I picked were like an inch, and these are about five inches, so they're, they're bigger than the actual rock. But they aren't, they aren't as big as some of my other paintings. My bird paintings and my dog paintings and my people paintings are huge. That, yeah, that's another rock. These are all Lake Superior rocks. I have a friend who has a cabin up there, and she uh, is always graciously inviting me up there, um, and, uh, and we get up to, to no good. And, uh, <laughs> and in the evenings, we sit and paint. She likes to paint, and, and um, so it's, it's quite fun. And I've collected a lot of rocks up there. So then you also love people, and so you gather people. Well, actually, people. I don't love people. <laughs> oh, well, you love to draw people. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I can tolerate people. Um, yeah, this is uh, life drawing. Um, uh, you know, I, I believe it's important to go and practice, and then I also get to use messy dry media. I never get to use charcoal in the studio because of my allergies. It'd just be too messy, but um, so I get to use it there. And that's actually the same uh, model. And this is just me. Uh, it's the end of the day, and I've got materials in my bag I haven't used yet. So the red was a watercolor brush pen from Ben. Uh, I don't know how you say it, Bien Fang. And um, and then that's Neo Color uh, is the purple, and the blue is a Montana marker. Oh, I should hold this up. I actually can people see things if I hold things up, or will that yes. mess? No, that's great. I I looked for a picture of um, um, stuff, so I don't know if you see that this is a Montana marker, and That's I started good. using these about two and a half years ago, 
And they're popular. These are the water-based ones. I don't see why Just I can't. Just hold it up a little higher. Oh, there. There okay. you go. There we go. And um, I don't know if you can see that tip. I'll hold the, something black behind it. Can you sort of see how wide that tip is? Yeah. This is the size I usually use, even when I'm cutting around really delicate work. And wow. I, if you just turn it on its edge and stuff, and it's, it's a lot of fun. And you have to shake it up. But um, I use the water-based uh, ones so they don't smell because I, I really mm. don't like smelly things. And it comes in different point sizes, but I hardly ever use the different point sizes. And then the other thing I really like is the Faber-Castell Pit Calligraphy Pen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I hold it here. You can sort of see it. Mm -hmm. And that also has a chiseled edge. My favorite thing of all is a dip pen. Uh, which is what I started. I learned to draw in Australia with a dip pen, um, but um, you know, it, I'm too messy, so I would have you know mess everywhere. So I have to accommodate, and so anything that's got a chisel tip that I can sort of twirl around, I'm excited about. I like the Pentel uh, Statler pigment liner. I'm sorry, this is a Statler pigment liner, and those are for my finer points. I like the. Pentel Pocket Brush Pen, which looks just like a fountain pen. It's probably the best thing in the world. I just love this. It's got real bristles, and um, people th think they're expensive, but they last for a really long time, so everyone should invest in one of those. And I have no stock in any of these companies, by the way. And uh, <laughs> Although although I, I frequently act as a paper pimp when I'm over at Wet Paint. It's like if I'm at the paper <laughs> counter and somebody comes up, and they're looking for a paper for something, and I overhear them. I sort of insinuate myself into that conversation. I can't help myself. It's kind of a sickness. Uh, <laughs> and they sort of they let that happen at Wet Paint because they don't mind me. Um, this is a this is also by Pentel. This is a Pentel color brush, but it has uh, pigment ink in it. Not all the color brushes do. The ones with gray barrels have pigment ink. The ones with black or colored barrels have have dye based inks, and those are not fugitive. Or those are fugitive, but this is a pigment one, and this has a fine point. And so I also like using these, but they're squeezy. This is what I mean by squeezy pens. And you got to be careful with those because you can end up with all sorts of tendon issues. <laughs> yeah. So, so what about when you? Because you're in a wintry place. Yep. What about in the winter? Um, somebody asked uh, if that they run out of things to draw in their house and they can't really go outside, What do you have any suggestions? Uh, well, uh, if they live in Antarctica, yes, they should stay inside. But anywhere else, they pretty much should get out. That's what Gore-Tex and, and uh, you know, polyfill are for. You know, you just put on your coat and out you go. Um, you wear layers. Uh, I've uh, This is a Niji water brush, which I, I use when I'm out on location. And then I have... I didn't put it out here, but I have a teeny tiny little kids palette. If people go to my blog and and um, mm -hmm. you know search for palettes, they'll see them. I have a little teeny kids palette that's about this big, so about one inch by two inches. And uh, I carry one of those with watercolor and one of those with gouache everywhere I go. And then this pen and with which is, this brush, which is filled with water, and that's all I need. And I don't make a mess in a paper towel. And I've been out in 20 degree weather as long as it's sunny and this hasn't frozen up on me. And you wear gloves. I have gloves that have, you know, the holes cut out and the little thing that falls back that you can put back for, you know, cover your mitten hand. Um, right. You, you know, if if you want to draw badly enough, you're going to get the gear to dress up and and go stand outside because actually living in Minnesota and part of it was all the time I spent in the fields with the girls because you know Alaska Malamutes want to be outside all winter long. Uh, and so we did our training in the winter, but um, what well, we did it all year, but but you know a lot of it in the winter um, is that if you dress correctly, you stay dry, you stay warm, and in Minnesota, while it might get cold, it's bright and sunny. And there have been days when I have stood in the middle of a field, totally sunny, blue sky, it's ten below, and I'm in a, a loose. Uh, turtleneck, cotton turtleneck, and a down vest, and I'm totally comfortable. So wow. it's totally doable, and I encourage people to get out because then you see shadows on the snow, you see colors in the snow, you see the trees in the winter, you see the birds that are you know happy to come through, you see the the owl, um, what is it? Those things they vomit up. I forget what the castings. You see those all around. There's so much stuff to draw. It's endless. Okay. Somebody <laughs> asked if your rocks were also gouache. Uh, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Okay. They're all. I, I, I sometimes will do one uh, if I'm traveling. I'll do one in watercolor, but all the ones we showed are gouache. Okay. 
Well, we're going to keep flipping through some of your um, life drawings. So usually yeah. people can find life drawing at a university. They'll have sometimes it will be free at, at certain nights or the community centers sometimes will do stuff like that. So, Or you, you can just go, out, go to the mall. Yeah, you go to the mall, except I took a, a, um, a group of students to the Mall of America uh, a couple years ago, and I found that I try not to go there. Uh, very often, uh, the noise was deafening, and mm. and I deal with a lot of noise, and normally that doesn't scare me off because the state fair is very noisy. But the Mall of America was just uh, a shock to the system. Uh, but um, uh, you can also do your own life drawing. You can have people. Um, uh, that's done with this. This drawing they're seeing now is done with one of these squeezy pens that that I showed the Pentel pen. Only it was done with the die base one, so it's water soluble. Right. Um, you know, get a couple people together and take turns. Uh, that's actually done at the allergist while I was waiting to get my allergy shot. People are in the other room. They don't know I'm looking at them. Right. All the nurses did. You know, they'd always come and ask what I was doing, you know, to see. They, they never told me to stop, so that was good. But, um, yeah, it's kind of fun. That's also the allergist. You, you get a sense for, uh, th this actually was a, a, in a movie. Uh, I was sick and I was drawing television, and I just am fascinated by hair. And so um, I saw this actress, and I just had to draw her hair. And it really was tinted only at the bottom like that. Huh. And I think there's another one that's, uh, yeah, that's also another actress with, I, I mean, look at that hair. It was like its own monument. <laughs> just, wow. It is. You know? But you, you have such a great way of just using a few strokes and getting the personality, the expression on the face, and that's one of the things that drew me into the fake journals was oh. those simple kind of um, lines that you're getting, and you're getting so much personality. Well, thank you. And that's a drawing I did of Dick from Life. He was sitting on the couch, and uh, it, I, I joke, it's, he's really impossible for me to draw because he has these really bushy eyebrows that sort of threaten to take over the world, and they're really light, so they're like blonde and gray at the same time. And so it's like, how do you even draw that? So I, I'm always fighting uh, myself when I have to try and draw him. But this is with Montana markers. I, I, I did a quick um, uh, thing with a thinner uh, magenta pen. And then I, with the big fat pens that I showed you, I just put in all these other colors. And Kate's asking if I can make the images larger. I can't, but I can give you the flicker. Um, uh, oh, oh! I'm sorry. I can make the big. Yes, I'm sorry. I had them small. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to keep going. This, th these are some of the journals that you have. I'm sorry, Kate. Um, that are these pictures are your bookcases of your journals that are, are not boxed. These are the yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. I I have pretty much every wall space that doesn't have a painting on it has a bookshelf. And so there's books all throughout the house, and uh, um, and this is you know, I made most of these books. The little yellow one in the center on that shelf uh, was my fake journal from 2009, and uh, it is a commercially bound book. But otherwise, I make most of my books until recently when I've had to use commercial ones while I'm recovering from a shoulder injury. So you enjoy the binding, the that part of the book process as well, correct? Yes, I do. Um, I I uh, I just find it really fascinating. But more importantly, I really love paper, and I love to do the experiments that I like to do, and I like to work the way I like to work. So if you know how to bind, you can put any kind of paper in a book, and it can be any size. It, as you can see, I work in various sizes. Right. And so you can have the paper that you want and work in the size that you want, and so binding makes that all possible for me. I am not interested in spending days and days and days binding a book. And so I have uh, truncated the methods that I use and that I teach are shortened versions of traditional methods because I want to be able to make a book quickly in a couple of hours, get out and start drawing. Right. So what about, um, I know you've had over 1,100, 11, yeah. <laughs> it's I, a lot. I, yeah, it's a lot. That's a lot of ones that you've made. Different sizes. How many do you have going right now? Like how many sketchbooks? Um, I have right now, I'm looking over at the table that's one. Um, I have three going right now. Usually I only have one. But in the last year, while I was doing all these commercial, using all these commercial books, it started to, it started to increase. And so I have, there's, um, 
there's a, a book. Can I hold this up? Can people see this? Yeah. It's a Let me Japanese make you bigger. blind notebook, and I've been doing a lot of stuff in these. Uh, they're really inexpensive. It's not meant to be painted on. In fact, you can sort of see here um, how the book is yawing open because it's been painted on. But I love right. working this book. And so this is my main journal right now. I carry it around with me. I sketch and stuff. Uh, but I also have a, a Fabriano Venezia 9 by 12 inch journal, which is my studio journal, um, so I can do bigger things. And then I have an even bigger uh, 11 by 14 Strathmore 500 series mixed media journal, where I can do you know even bigger, bigger things. And and you know I, I work chronologically, so it's difficult for me working in in multiple journals, which is why my preference is to work one at a time. But I found in the last couple of years my work is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And even before I got a shoulder injury, it wasn't. You can't walk around with a four, 11 by 14 journal under your hand, you know. <laughs> it just you start to look a little obvious, you know. You, right. you unfold it, and and then you're like this, and it's like everybody's, what the heck is she doing, you know? Um, that's when you get asked to leave places. But um, so, so you're finishing the binding first, and then you're going out in the field. Yeah. Or are you getting all these different pages, and then you're binding them together? Um, no, I I usually bind a book and then take it out into the field. I will work on loose sheets. Uh, if people look on my website and and look for, um, I don't think I gave you any slides of this, but sometimes my state fair stuff I do on on journal cards, which I make with 300 uh, pound uh, uh, watercolor paper that I pre-paint with some kind of background, and then I'll take a stack of of uh, 15 cards or so uh, each time I go to the state fair and just paint on as many as I can. And as I finish one. I'll put it away and get out another one. But then they stay loose and get bound into a portfolio. So do you regularly go through your old um, sketchbooks for ideas or anything? What I found is that um, after about 10 years, if I haven't done the painting that I've done thumbnails for or worked on the series that I came up with in that journal, I'm probably not going to. So for space considerations, every 10 years, um, well, I, that's not, I don't know how to say this, but the last 10 years of journals are called, at the beginning of every year, the last 10 years are taken away, So, um, but that's actually just one year. But So what I'm trying right. to say is the past 10 years current are out and about, and I can walk up to them on the shelves, and everything else is put away. And All right. Can, so, pardon oh, me? Go no, go ahead. And, and I index my journals, and people can read about that on my blog, too, because otherwise that would take the rest of the show. Um, but, but the thing is, um, if, I, if I want, like, raccoon, if someone says, you know, we want a raccoon or whatever, I can go to my digital or paper index, and I can look up raccoon, and I can see all the places when I've drawn a raccoon, either from roadkill, because I draw a lot of roadkill, or from life, because maybe somebody had it at a, at a sanctuary, or um, from the Bell Museum and I can get all of my reference things and so then I can go back and pull old volumes and, and use those. All right. All right. So let's we're gonna talk a little bit about somebody Jan wanted to know what the brand of Japanese journal was. I don't know. It's, it's called uh, it, it's I don't know how they pronounce it. A P I C A. Okay. But there are a lot of different ones, so she should really look on my my blog because they make a lot of different papers. Okay. So then Stay um, fair. Uh, yeah, so State Fair. So we have some, um, but she she had a question about the painted backgrounds, pre-painted backgrounds, and that's kind of um, one of the next ones that we were getting to was what's the key to sketching quickly, and as I read through your blog, I noticed many times that you start with these pre-painted backgrounds. So is this something that you would recommend and something that's worked for you or works for you sometimes, not all the time? Well, I, I love to pre-paint. Can we, can we, I hate to say this, can we flip, quickly through the State Fair stuff and yep. get to the painted backgrounds so people can can actually see because because the backgrounds in the State Fair stuff were added after I'd drawn the main drawing. They weren't pre-painted. I love those pigs. Those are yeah. awesome. Pigs are great. They are great. Oh, stop for just a sec. Go back. Okay. I, I just want to reinforce with that that sheep um, um, back. Or maybe it's not going to... If you can't, don't, but... That no, was, it, I, can, I can go back. It just isn't letting me write the second. Oh, there we go. There. Um, this is an example of not worrying about perfect and just getting something down. Uh, you know, I've, I've got some gestures here of the way they have their heads and I can see the dimensionality. 
So basically, I, on that right-hand page, I could use any of those three sketches at the top and, and incorporate them in a painting. Right. All right, so I think it's having trouble with one image, so I'm going to skip it. Yep, yep. That's at the State Fair, too. Oh, it's having trouble with many images. Hang on, let me... Um, Talk a little bit about pre-painted. Let me um, okay. get. I'm going to pull you up, and I'm going to look over here. <clears throat> on computer. So, so basically, I like to pre-paint pages because I like to set problems for myself, and then come up. You know, then you, you're forced to find a solution, and that for me is the fun aspect of it. And so, um, what I do there's there's I see a pigeon one there that might be a nice one to talk about. Okay. Because there's a before and an after for that one. Although maybe they didn't get together, and um, and basically. Um, I like the challenge of having that pre-painting. So what I'll do is when I start a new journal, I will go through the journal and uh, if it's one that I've bound myself, um, I usually will uh, cut out a couple of pages at various points. I've done this long enough that I sort of know how much collage material I'm going to add to it. So that's the first thing I do to a new journal um, to make room for the stuff I'm going to stick in there. And then the second thing I do is um, I go through and I start to just slap some paint around. And so, um, can they see all the Flickr images? Or they, I'm going to give them a link to it, um, okay. so then they can go to it. Let me. If for some reason, they're uh, this computer. I need a new computer over here. But I will. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to look it up over here. I'll give them the link. For okay. some reason, we can look at them small. We just can't. I can't make them bigger. But okay. Well, the the thing. The basically the thing is that you think of it in this way. Um, uh, you want to think about some color theory and what colors would look good together, and you have to think about light and dark. So if if you if you um, are going to paint opaquely, you can go a little bit darker with your backgrounds. If you're going to throw watercolor on top of it, you're going to have to keep it a little light, or it's really going to impact on your watercolors. And then the other thing to think about when you're pre-painting is is the final layer going to be dry media or is it going to be wet media? And uh, if uh, in this case, what I put down on the background were a bunch of layers of those big, thick Montana marker pens. I just scribbled them everywhere. And then I drew, uh, with a Pentel brush pen, I drew the young man from an antique photo. And then I drew the chicken from some of my state fair sketches. And then I painted uh, both the young man and the chicken with gouache. And I could do that without fear of lifting anything up because I used those acrylic markers underneath um, to um, make the background. And so, uh, and there's also some stenciling, and I use an ink that is, or a, a stenciling, or a rubber stamp ink that's uh, water, um, uh, uh, water resistant, which is Brilliance, uh, is the name of the brand, and I just love it. And they have a very rich black, and, uh, and they have some other lovely shiny sparkly colors. Um, but you can see that behind the kid's head, you can see a little bit of uh, rubber stamp stenciling. Oh, yeah. I think there might also be some tape on there, but I, I don't see it off the top of my head. And then there's also some rubber stamp images. So, so basically think of it in that way. If you're going to use color pencil as your last layer, you can paint your pages in watercolor or gouache, anything water soluble, it doesn't matter. If you're going to use watercolor or gouache as your last uh, level or layer, then you should think about using water resistant or waterproof uh, layers underneath that. And um, uh, some of these, I guess they can't see. I had um, a, a jelly print, a jelly plate, and I made uh, mono prints on the pages uh, in various ways, and then uh, painted and sketched on top of that in gouache. And so um, uh, you can kind of see a little bit of that. Okay, yeah, and so that's, uh, so f can, can they see the Tootsie Pop? Or actually, it's not a Tootsie Pop, it's a Dum Dum. Can they see that? Yep. Yeah, so that's basically all of this stuff in the back is uh, pr printed down there with the gel plate, with acrylic paint. And so that's not going anywhere. That's what, you know, there, you can see I use bubble wrap to imprint right. some of that acrylic paint to get the, the little circles and stuff. And, uh, and sometimes, if I'm just cleaning the plate, I'll take all the excess ink and I'll just scribble it all over the page. And then I, I painted or drew that Dum Dum Sucker, which I got at the Firefighters Hall. Uh, actually, this is a fake journal, so that was my character got that sucker, so I'm sorry I misspoke. And then, right. 
and then um, uh, painted uh, in gouache over that. And then I just put blue, light blue gouache all around it to isolate it from what was rather a busy background. Right. So tell us a little bit about the fake journals. And Roz, we'll just have to have you back on because we're running out of time. <laughs> but tell people what what April is, why you started it, and um, and uh, me and Micah both think you should be on Instagram more because you have like one photo. So it's, it's a great oh, meeting. Oh, yeah, Instagram. I'm a verbal person, so Instagram doesn't work for me. Okay. Yeah, it's it, it's not going to happen. Instagram and Twitter. I you know how many characters you get? Forty characters in Twitter. You know, read one of my blog posts. They're like three thousand words long. You know, right. Short doesn't work for me. I'm a Victorian. Okay. So so anyway. Um, uh, International Fake Journal Month is something I've always kept fake journals since I was young. I had uh, teachers that encouraged me to do fake things, and um, that's that's also something for another topic. And um, anyway, uh, when in 2000, I was traveling around a lot with my friend Linda because we were working on the Minnesota Journal Project 2000, and um, I was talking about the project to her and. Uh, and she really was intrigued with it, and we started joking more about it. And I started mentioning it to some of my students in my in-person classes, and uh, and they sort of took the idea and were starting to run with it and have fun with it. And so when I got a blog in 2008, uh, after as April came up, I thought I'm going to start a blog and take it nationally. And I did in 2009. Uh, and basically, it starts in April because. Uh, April 1st is April Fool's Day, so when better to start a, a you know a facetious project, right? And, and then also April because that's tax uh, season here in the U.S. <laughs> and um, well, well, the thing is that um, we have a division of labor in our household, and my husband does the taxes, but he likes to take his own sweet time, and I get very nervous about that. So to get my mind off of that, I always have to have a project in April. So that's the other reason it's in April. And um, basically, the the only rule about it is that it has to be a journal. That you have to be in another character's mind, and that um, uh, if you are, if it's if you're going to do an entry that's timed at 7:30, you actually have to be making that entry at 7:30. And so, if they can see some of these big ones from last year, these are 22 by 30 inch pieces. Um, one of them is 10.30 p.m. That was actually drawn at 10.30 p.m. I get into my character's mode, I draw something, and, and then respond as the character does. It's not something that you can do all in a weekend. It's not like writing a book. All of that is faux journals, and, and this isn't about faux. This is about fake. And the reason I stress this is because the point of it is to actually uh, get yourself away from the... Uh, mindset. The, the reason I went public with it and use it in my classes is a lot of students have their internal critic won't shut up. And if your character is doing this and your in internal critic complains about the quality of what's happening, then all you have to do is say, "Well, I didn't do that. You know, <laughs> so I have no responsibility for that. So you know, complain to somebody else, talk to the hand, whatever. You know." And uh, I found that students were able to run with that and get a little bit more freeing and bring that back to their journal. And it's also a way to just experiment, and again, it's a way to have fun. So um, I, I really recommend that people give it a try. Um, and uh, it's starting soon. They can go to the, um, the other website, which is also listed on my blog, and I think you have a link for that. I do. I'm going to put it up right now. Yeah, and then there's two pieces here, if they can see those. The one on my left um, that looks like a graphic novel is by Ellen Ward. Um, she's a, a illustrator and teacher, and uh, she's participated a number of years. And she came up with this lovely style um, that she worked in last year. And then the one on the uh, right is by Anne Bray, and she created a character who would look initially at uh, clothing and, and make a, a clothing entry uh, each day, and this is important because this was a very simple concept which she in her very busy life was able to execute and actually continues to do uh, and so I wanted to show that uh, you really should think about very simple concepts that you can execute in very little time um, and uh, and then have the best success for doing it so I recommend the first time someone do this that they maybe plan on using five or ten minutes a day and um, there's there's one there where I did clouds every day and um, and that was because I knew I could look out the window and see the clouds every day, and it took me less than five minutes a day to to do an entry. 
Well, and I think the um, I wish I could pull this up bigger. This um, the guy that says does really does anyone really know? <laughs> yeah, like the his eyes. Why you made them red? But to well, me, it is a beautiful. Maybe I can make it bigger. Well, there, there's a funny story. This was last year, and I knew I was going to be housebound because of my shoulder injuries, and I had a lot of elder care to do, uh, which would take my free time. So I asked people if they would send me photographs. And so all of the pictures here are people who were being very good sports and sent me photographs. Sometimes, like the woman uh, with the bird, um, uh, Carol, uh, she made faces. And, um, and she was just a real, really good sport about that. And I call that the Freddie Mercury mouth. And uh, so anyway, um, and then I drew from them and because I knew I wasn't going to be able to get out. So it wasn't ideal, but I was still able to pursue doing uh, the faces that I wanted. The one that you're talking about, the hopscotch one, uh, I was on the phone with my good friend Diane, and she mentioned that her husband had just had eye surgery, you know, to because you have the, the lids, you know, pushing right. down and, and affecting your vision. And he just had that done. We have the same eye doctor. And uh, so I said, oh, would Eric mind sending a picture of me so I can use him for my project? And, <laughs> and my friends are such good sports that he immediately complied. And so I did this, and my character, uh, you know, this was what was going on in her brain at the time and got that down. So that's, that's what happened. But really, they're, they, I, I just know people who are tremendously good sports and encourage me pretty much uh, all the time. So I, I'm very fortunate. Well, you have amazing um, affinity for life and capturing it, and it capturing those kind of maybe odd moments. But again, it's these simple lines that you're putting down. It's it's very difficult to draw with that few lines and get across the emotion. I think that you're getting across. So huge, Why huge you get a compliment. Pencil, brush pen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you have to have a lot of practice, too, and I think it's nice to know that in, in time, you have always given yourself a 365 project and that you you have seen yourself grow as a as an artist, and I think that's encouraging for somebody just starting out, and I think it's good to challenge yourself and use different media and paint the background and, and all kinds of things, and we just really barely touched on some of these questions, Roz. So we'll get you scheduled back, and we'll do a part two. And I hope everybody chal challenges in themselves in April. And and really, I'm gonna I'm gonna try it. I am. It will not look like yours, I know, but um, I'm gonna do it for myself. And so you started this. Those aren't mine, Diane. <laughs> these right here are. Those aren't mine. Okay, so so great. <laughs> Somebody else did that. <laughs> so then, what about? Um, oh, so I'm going to share some of your links. I'm going to go back and share all the ones that I've shared before, just in case somebody missed them. So this is your. Um, this is your. Uh, that's your journal pieces from. Um, you changed from 1996 through 2008. You had. Um, you did journal pieces here and then wherever the I don't know if yeah, the I, I stopped updating my I, I know it's bad form and bad business but my website hasn't been updated since 2003 because all my work is by referral and nobody goes there and once I started doing well actually it hasn't been upgraded since 2008 when I started the blog because I put my current uh, journaling stuff on there and and that's what you know interests me to share with uh, you know art students and stuff like that and so I, I just haven't updated the other stuff. And then you also have a YouTube channel, which I, I that was another place I had seen some of the fake journaling, where you're actually just going through and you're flipping the pages. And there are times when I actually paused because I wanted to see, um, I wanted to see what these were uh, a little bit bigger um, or it's longer, I guess. And then. Let me. Uh, well, you know, you can see a gigapan. I, I don't think I sent you a link for these, but if they if they search on my blog for the uh, 2014 uh, thing, they can see a gigapan of this fake exhibition we did of all these. Yeah. You can zoom. My friend Tom did. You know, with the gigapan. You can zoom in so that like you're three, you know, millimeters away. Yeah, that one, that is awesome. That is an amazing tool, and you could really zoom in for that. That was great. And then you also have done, posted on other places, which um, there's the Artist Journal Workshop yep. and also Urban Sketchers. 
Yeah, Urban Sketchers Twin Cities. I'm a, I'm a member of that group, and, and uh, we get out and sketch and do fun things. And then you're also teaching some things, so people need to know about some of the things that you're teaching. So tell them a little bit about, and I'm going to share the link. Well, uh, right now, actually, I'm teaching a class. It's wrapping up. It, it'll be offered again in the future sometime, but uh, at Sketchbook School, which is sketchbookschool.com, uh, there's uh, three classes they have right now. I'm in the one that came out first, which is called Beginning, and I have a, there's six instructors, and I'm week five, and it's Beginning uh, Drawing Animals from Life, and you'll see some tips and, and things that I do. You'll actually see me do a, um, a live uh, model sketch, and so I think that I'm pretty excited about that. That's a nice class, and, uh, and then I'm starting uh, just online classes that are just me, uh, I have a bookbinding class, which is going to hopefully be up by March. I'm 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 through with the video, and um, and I'm very excited about it. Uh, but I have to get the platform set up first, and uh, that's why it's a little bit delayed from what I'd hoped. But it is uh, uh, making a simple round back spine, which is an ideal book for making a visual journal. And I will follow it up with other books that I like to make and also with various art classes, uh, some more drawing of animals, some more uh, drawing in public, and just pretty much everything that I do, my gouache class, my color theory class, you know, I'll just keep doing it till people don't sign up. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> then I'll, 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 I don't know what I'll do. But, but and you'll announce this when? On when? my blog. On my on blog. Your blog. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Roz, thank you so much. I, um, I... I can't wait to have you back. We'll have to hope maybe it'll be um, in the middle of April and we can talk a little bit more about fake journaling and so why. It's not in August during the state fair. No, we will do it not during the state fair for sure. But if you Although it would be kind of fun if I did one from the state fair. <laughs> that would that could be cool. We'd have to be able to see what you were drawing, so that that would be awesome. But thank you again so much. And if you want to follow me so that you never miss another episode, you can always um, – oh, the bookbinding class will be online. Is that yep. correct? It's, it's yeah. going to be online, yep. Mm -hmm. And you ha you said you have ideas for lots of other classes, so yep. Roz has lots of things coming down the pipe, so just be ready. Um, and next week we have Bob Ewing. He has also done – he does a project today, and it's more lettering, but – he definitely saw an increase in what he was able to do too. So maybe some of y'all in the um, room will come back next week, same time, and then I'll definitely let you know when we have Roz back on. You're getting tons of love over there in the chat, Roz. So thank you again so much, and thanks for having thanks for your energy. All right, guys, I will see you next week. Okay.